एक बार फिर से बंद किया जा रहा है किया जा चुका चीफ जस्टिस ने कहा कि जियो किसने बंद कराया सुप्रीम कोर्ट में मीडिया कमीशन के मुतालिक समाप्त हुई जियो टीवी ने कर दिया जाए क्योंकि जियो टीवी को सबसे बड़ा झटका दे दिया गया वो काम कर दिया गया जो कोई पाकिस्तानी सोच भी न सकता था Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the stories we're covering this week. Pakistan's biggest news channel goes dark. Is the military there playing power games with the news media? In India, journalists reporting on the world's largest biometric database find themselves targeted over their work. As Palestinians face live fire from the Israeli army, a journalist clearly marked as a member of the press is among those killed. And he created Facebook to quote connect the world. But Mark Zuckerberg admits that even he didn't know what he was getting into. I started Facebook. I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. Usually, when the authorities take a television channel off the air, they're not shy to talk about it because they want a signal sent to other media outlets. You could be next. Not in Pakistan. Until recently, the most watched broadcast network there was Geo TV. Early last month, Geo went to black. It remains off the air across much of the country, and no one in a position of authority is saying why. Government ministers and the broadcasting regulator have denied any involvement. The cable companies that pulled the plug on Geo are staying silent, as is the Pakistani military, which has butted heads with Geo before and is suspected by numerous political and media observers as having ordered the blackout, with no explanation offered, and with a former prime minister Nawaz Sharif on trial for corruption, as well as elections coming. It would seem that Geo's dominance of the media landscape has once again put it on a collision course with the Pakistani military. Our starting point this week is the capital, Islamabad. Take the biggest news channel in any given country: Globo in Brazil, the BBC in Britain, Channels TV in Nigeria, or Rai in Italy. Now imagine those channels just fading to black one day, disappearing from most screens nationwide. And when the governments of those countries are asked to explain why, they say they simply don't know. Imagine the cable companies and broadcast regulators involved offering the same non-explanation, and rival news channels choosing, for the most part, to ignore the story. That is what has happened in Pakistan with Geo TV. Who is suspending Geo? No one has. Accepted the responsibility of shutting it down. When I spoke to uh, the cable operators on the record, they said that, "Oh, we don't know uh, if the channels are being blocked. It must have been some mistake." But when I switched off my uh, tape recorder, uh, they told me that, uh, "See, the powers who have instructed us to shut down these channels are much bigger than any government." So who is that power that is much bigger than this government? That would be the military establishment. Pakistan has existed for just over seven decades, spending almost half of that time, 32 years, under military rule. Today, it has a civilian government in name, but the generals seldom stray far from power. When the country's most recent military ruler, Pervez Musharraf, took over in 1999. Pakistan had only one television network, the state-owned PTV. Musharraf liberalized the airwaves, allowing for privately owned channels. Today, Pakistan has 86 of them. It's a competitive news landscape, the desperate chase for ratings, often producing sensationalized partisan journalism. It can leave viewers riled rather than informed. Geo TV was among the first of the private news channels to get a license. It grew into a market leader, although Musharraf back then and various civilian governments since have taken issue with the channel's news coverage. Geo's editorial policy is perhaps one of the best that we've seen in Pakistan. Whenever there is opinion presented, any particular issue which relates to civilian or the military, there is always opposing views present in the conversation. Why can't the government take preventive measures? Both issues are connected. They are political issues. In political issues, things are political. वो होती है यहाँ सेंसिटिविटी बहुत होती है दिस इज अ ट्रेट दैट वी हैव नॉट सीन इन मेनी चैनल्स इन पाकिस्तान जियो टी वी वॉज लॉन्च इन टू थाउजेंड टू एंड इन दोज डेज परवेज मुशर्रफ वॉज द रूलर ऑफ पाकिस्तान एंड जियो टी वी प्लेड अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट रोल फॉर द प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ सिविल लिबर्टीज फॉर द रेस्टोरेशन ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी इन दिस कंट्री 
if anyone want to kill to murder jio tv jio tv will be killed but the credibility of pakistan at international level will also suffer 2007 onwards is a period when uh, private media in pakistan grew uh, but as jio found its feet uh, it you know randomly started to kind of deviate from the policies from the uh, state narrative on certain issues aap nekta ke sarbara hain aap kya dekhte hain ki kya waqai pakistan hakani network ko support karta pakistan support nahi karta and what we see now is actually jio trying to not completely follow uh, the state narrative on politics uh, and that is largely considered to be the source of current friction between between the channel and the military jio was offering a bit of an alternative uh, and even that was not tolerated Authorities in various countries tend to grow less tolerant of critical journalism as elections approach, and Pakistan has one coming up later this year. Among the election-related topics Geo has covered that may have landed it in trouble, the 18th Amendment, a constitutional change made in 2010 that forbids the military from getting involved in political areas outside its own remit of defense. आपने लिखा कि बाजवा डॉक्ट्रीन विल बी हैप्पी टू डू अवे विद द 18th अमेंडमेंट यानी कि खत्म हो जाए 18th अमेंडमेंट द आर्मी चीफ ऑफ स्टाफ वांट्स दैट अमेंडमेंट अबॉलिश्ड जियो हैज टेकन अ कॉन्ट्ररी एंड देयरफॉर पॉलिटिकली कंटेंशियस व्यू देन देयर इज द करप्शन ट्रायल ऑफ नवाज शरीफ द डिफेंडेंट इज अ फॉर्मर प्राइम मिनिस्टर हु द सुप्रीम कोर्ट परमानेंटली बैनड फ्रॉम पॉलिटिक्स दिस पास्ट वीक एंड हुज विजिबिलिटी हैज बीन मच हायर ऑन जियो देन ऑन अदर न्यूज़ चैनल्स recently new york times wrote an article and they claimed that jio is supporting nawaz sharif so that's why uh, some powerful people in pakistan are not happy with the jio tv and that's why jio tv is shut down i personally don't support nawaz sharif but uh, even if jio is supporting nawaz sharif it is not a legal excuse to shut down a tv channel jio has been giving space to very diverse voices um there have been people who very passionately speak against the corruption of mia nawaz sharif and his family nawaz sharif ne adalat ko kabhi sach na bataya and there are people who have been uh, speaking in a very objective manner to describe the, the, this entire trial ab tak case mein se kuch nahi nikla jisse mia nawaz sharif sahab ki jo jise hum keh sakte hain lafzon mein kam az kam ek damning indictment nahi nikli mia nawaz sharif sahab ki there was nothing to instigate to trigger this at all the only thing is that jio and don tv these are the two only two channels right now in pakistan who are not succumbing to the dictation from the military establishment to gauge just how supine most of the pakistani news media have become how fearful they have grown of the military and how competitive the news industry there is don't consider what they have said about the geo story but what they have not their almost complete silence on the sidelining of their journalistic colleagues at another network tells its own story one that could in the not too distant future come back to haunt them geo's story has not been reported anywhere except for the social media and this is extremely unfortunate this is the level of competition that we have in pakistan it's not just competition it's rivalry and so naturally we don't expect any of these rivals to be reporting the shutdown of jio why would they it's good for their business you know it's plain as simple as that the lesson learned by these media owners has been that they have to succumb uh, they have to surrender they have to uh, oblige the hidden powers um, which are not so hidden and that is why you won't see any voice from within the media against the closure media has never been so silent against the state coercion it's a very uh, critical moment in in pakistan's media industry when it has to make choices and stand up for itself uh, because if it doesn't stand up then there will be little difference between cc's egypt and this pakistan
We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Johanna Hoos. Joe, for more than two weeks now, Palestinians have been staging mass demonstrations at Gaza's border with Israel. The Israeli military has killed dozens of Palestinians, a journalist among them. What are the details? Well, Richard, six Palestinian journalists have reportedly been shot at the border by Israeli soldiers while covering what's being called the Great March of Return, weekly protests against decades of Israeli occupation. Now, photojournalist Yazer Martaja died of his wounds on April 7th. He had founded Ain Media, which is a TV production company based in Gaza, but that also works for outlets outside Palestine, including Al Jazeera. He is one of at least 31 Palestinians killed by Israeli fire during the protest. Israel has been using live ammunition against these demonstrators, which human rights groups say is illegal. How has Israel been responding to that? Israel argues that its soldiers are shooting in a, quote, precise and measured way and that the use of lethal force is necessary to protect its borders. But according to the Palestinian journalist syndicate, Mortaja was 100 meters away from the border fence when he was shot. And they also say that the other journalists wounded were all wearing flak jackets clearly marked press, which disputes Israel's position that it is only targeting instigators who are attacking soldiers. Moving on now to Azerbaijan. The re-election this past week of President Ilham Aliyev to a third term in office surprised absolutely no one. Media freedom has been an issue there. What were reporting conditions like during the campaign? In the run-up to the vote, the government systematically cracked down on critical voices. They were amending laws and blocking news websites critical of the president and his family. Last year, Parliament passed a law which allows authorities to permanently shut down sites without a court ruling. Now, among the news outlets affected were the Azeri language service of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, Berlin-based online news agency Made on TV, a daily newspaper Azadlik, and online broadcaster Turan TV. And in what other ways is the Aliyev government trying to control the message? Through policing and the courts, by the end of 2017, at least 10 journalists were behind bars. Now, according to the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists, the authorities have accused some of financial misdemeanors and in other cases imposed travel bans. And it's not just those reporters inside the country that are affected. In May of last year, investigative journalist Afghan Mortarli, who was based in Georgia, disappeared only to serve as an in Azerbaijani prison two days later. He's currently serving a six-year prison prison sentence for, among other things, smuggling and resisting arrest. Okay, thanks, Joe. Data security, data privacy, surveillance, they're all over the news these days. Stories related to big tech companies like Facebook, Google, and Apple. In India, however, that debate is taking place over a nationwide identity program that's run by the government. It's called Adhar. Adhar is the world's biggest biometric ID system. It took over a decade to design and roll out. More than 1.2 billion Indians have been signed up to it. But it's been dogged by legal challenges, questions over privacy, and now investigations by the news media. Those questions all land at the feet of the unique identification authority of India, the UIDAI. It's the government body in charge of Adhar and the perceptions around it. And that's no easy job. Despite news reports raising legitimate questions about data privacy and identity theft, the UIDAI has stuck to its line that Adhar is secure. However, the tactics that the organization has used to hound journalists, police complaints, legal threats, cutting off access, hasn't made it look good. The Listening Post's Meenakshi Ravi now with the Adhar story and one of the journalists targeted for her work on it. local papers seldom make headlines across the country. On the 3rd of January, however, a paper in the northern state of Punjab, the Tribune, published an investigation that went national. The article revealed that the private details of millions of Indians gathered under the government's Aadhaar scheme, the world's largest biometric ID system, could be bought cheap. Are your Aadhaar details? According to a report by the newspaper The Tribune, all it takes is 500 rupees and 10 minutes to dig out the details of anyone. Tribune ko WhatsApp ke zariye ek anjan vyakti ne message aaya ki aapko ek Arab se zyada Aadhaar dharko ki jankariyon tak asimit pravesh mil jayega. See, Aadhaar is the um, flagship program of the government of India. It is having the entire uh, biometrics and uh, demographic details of every Indian. Right, over a billion, uh, you know, citizens. These people on WhatsApp group, they were providing an illegal gateway. 
to the Aadhaar database offering the software for rupees 500. Once you have a login ID, once you have an unauthorized access, once you have entered into the gateway, the data which is getting accessed is from the central database. The Aadhaar database is managed by the Unique Identification Authority of India, the UIDAI. To register, Indians must provide their basic information, like their name, birth date and gender. They also have to submit biometric information, a photograph, fingerprints and eye scans. The program is the keystone in an ambitious plan to digitize India's economy and to make the distribution of state welfare more efficient. However, Aadhaar was a major issue in India even before the Tribune's revelations on the data breach. Just days after the article was published, the UIDAI was at the Supreme Court, arguing that the Aadhaar program was legal, that it didn't infringe on the privacy of Indian citizens. The Tribune's story did not help the government's case, and the UIDAI was clearly displeased. It was disconcerting, but it turned out to be far less egregious than it was made out to be. The local collector had been given a user ID and login, which was compromised. Now, this journalist got access to it, and when she keyed in one or two Aadhaar numbers that she is familiar with, she found those details, name, date of birth, photograph. So to suggest that this has been, the entire billion data has been leaked for 500 rupees is a little uh, exaggerated and uh, ought to have been reported responsibly. Zoheb Hussain is a lawyer for the government. He has represented the UIDAI in multiple cases. His criticism of Rashna Khera's reporting is diplomatically put. His client, the UIDAI, was much less restrained. Days after Khera's report was published, it filed a police complaint against her. The reporter was stuck in a bind in a sense, right? If she did not buy that access, there was no way that her report would be deemed trustworthy enough. But just because of the fact that she did do that, the UIDAI went and filed a police case against her. And we've seen this in the past as well, that they've been disingenuous in their approach. So another journalist uh, called Debayan Roy from CNN IBN, he got a fake ID done and enrolled for Aadhaar under a fake name. This is neither my name nor address or identity. This false Aadhaar enrollment costed me around 700 rupees to get done. Which indicates that there's a security process lapse. Now he tracked all of this on a hidden camera and he reported it. Next thing you know, a case is filed against him. What UIDA does is they issue blanket statements and they deny everything at first. And then they go back, they decide whether they have to take action or not. And they actually filed a police complaint against the journalist, which backfired on them. That's when the UIDA realized its mistake and stopped. If it hadn't been for the Tribune, which is highly respected and it's a 200-year-old organization, she would have been in jail. Srinivas Kodali has had run-ins with the UIDAI as well. Last year, he co-wrote a paper for the Bangalore-based Centre for Internet and Society, the CIS, documenting instances of financial details being leaked from the Aadhaar database. The UIDAI sent not one, but three legal warnings to the CIS, and that was followed by questions from the Home Ministry about the organization's funding sources. The UIDAI's official line on data security has been that the reporting is inaccurate, overblown and misleading. Many journalists we spoke to, however, said that dealing with the UIDAI is problematic, that officials there are elusive and often unavailable for comment. With the explosion of stories around data privacy and security on Facebook, however, the conversation in India has become even more relevant. I would say that Adha is more dangerous uh, because uh, it's essentially disproportionate amount of data in the hands of the state. And they're connecting things like traffic violations, property records, land holding size, religion and caste, which is data which should not be linked to and collected and used by the state. Right? So I, I think the risks are substantially greater in terms of misuse of this data. You don't publish your bank account number on Facebook, okay? But through Aadhaar, by linking your Aadhaar number with your bank account, your passport, your driver license, everything, all the state IDs, by linking them, you are actually enabling further surveillance. The harms are very different, but when you compare the technology, it's both the same. I think uh, the 
two domains are extremely different and disparate. Facebook has far more personally sensitive information about you and me than Aadhaar. Aadhaar has very little information about you. Aadhaar is only a tool to match your identity and say that yes, you are who you claim to be. The Aadhaar story is about more than just surveillance and security. The nationwide identity program was designed to streamline the distribution of welfare across India. In a country where almost two-fifths of food, fuel and other forms of welfare get stolen by middlemen, a trackable, accountable system is clearly in the public interest. The UIDAI argues Aadhaar would fill that vacuum. Only a few media outlets have really pursued that story. So we've had online publications like Scroll um, and The Wire, and they've reported on exclusion. So, you know, for poor people, because their fingerprints also age and they don't necessarily match, they've indicated that, you know, there are issues where people aren't getting necessary rations. There are instances where laborers are finding that their fingerprints get scraped easily because of the manual labor that they do. So for people for whom it's absolutely necessary to get welfare, they're being denied. But apart from the Hindi and the local language newspapers, we're not seeing that much reportage and we're not seeing enough of broader reportage taking place. Journalists covering the Aadhaar story are having to tread carefully. Two months after that Tribune report was published, the editor of the paper resigned. He gave no reason, but sources at the paper said the pressure on him after the Aadhaar expose was huge. Reporter Rachna Kera says Aadhaar is still the story she wants to cover. But first, she has to clear her name. I've been accused of uh, hatching a conspiracy. I've been charged under Section 419, 420, 468 and 471. Uh, that pertains to cheating, personation, dishonesty, forgery, Section 36 and 37 of the Aadhaar Act that is having unauthorized access of the database. I've been accused and uh, now I'm on the fugitive list of the Delhi Police. All I wanted was to highlight these concerns. I'm depressed to see how officials, instead of paying concerns to the issues which I have raised in my story, they have made me a story. I have become a story. Finally, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg's appearance before a congressional committee in Washington this past week had its moments, including a few where legislators revealed just how little they know about technology. One senator asked Zuckerberg how his business model works when users don't pay for the service. Senator, he replied, we run ads. And that's the thing about the Facebook privacy story. The platform, its 2.2 billion users, and government regulators are all in uncharted territory. Everyone's learning on the job, including Zuckerberg. When we covered this story a few weeks back, an academic we interviewed, Shiva Vaidyanathan, had a particular take on Facebook, the man who runs it, and education. We'll leave you with his thoughts and see you next time here at The Listening Post. Mark Zuckerberg has said on a number of occasions that the more people connect with each other, the less they'll hate each other, the better we'll, they'll treat each other, right? Facebook is an idealistic and optimistic company. For most of our existence, we focused on all of the good that connecting people can do. Mark Zuckerberg is a brilliant man. He's a deeply sensitive man. He's a very concerned man. He really does think and believe that he can and will make the world a better place. I'm committed to getting this right, and I believe that over the coming years, once we fully work all these solutions through, um, people will see real, real differences. But he's deeply uneducated. He has no appreciation of the inhumanity that human beings are capable of. But it's clear now that we didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. And that goes for fake news, foreign interference in elections, and hate speech, as well as developers and data privacy. I think he made a big mistake dropping out of Harvard to build this system. You know, I, I wish he would call me up and say, I'd like to come back and finish my degree at the University of Virginia. I think it's it's pretty much impossible, I, I believe, to start a company in your dorm room and then grow it to be at the scale that we're at now without um, making some mistakes. Have them come to my office and you know, lay out a bunch of courses, philosophy courses, sociology courses, history courses. You might teach them something, something that he's not going to learn at Davos hanging, out, hanging around Henry Kissinger. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. <laughs>